This week, both at home and abroad, the American people have been pleading for broad-mindedness, tolerance, and charity. Abroad, the American State Department has been using all of its powers to make Colonel Nasser of Egypt understand the meaning of the words charity, tolerance, and the spirit of give and take, while at the same time pressuring the British and the French to have the same spirit. At home, where racial tensions are mounting by the hour, particularly in the South, Many voices are calling for moderation, broad-mindedness, tolerance, and charity in this burning issue that threatens to divide the American people as they've not been divided since the Civil War. This past week, the World Methodist Council has been meeting at Lake Junaluska, representing more than 40 million Methodists. I have been privileged to attend this conference, and I have seen Africans, Asiatics, Middle Easterners, South Americans, and Americans meeting under one roof, worshiping the same Christ. Again, we have heard many discussions this week concerning understanding, tolerance, broad-mindedness, and charity in the church. Two outstanding churchmen were discussing in my presence at Lake Jinluska the fact that in some areas the church has become too tolerant and too broad-minded and that it has lost many of its great convictions. There is a sense in which the world needs broad-mindedness and tolerance, and certainly we all need understanding and charity. However, in the realm of Christian experience, there is also a need for tolerance in certain areas. In some things, Christ was the most tolerant, broad-minded man that ever lived. And yet, in other things, he was one of the most intolerant of men. One of the pet words of this age is tolerance. It is a good word, but we've tried to stretch it over too great an area of life. We've applied it too often where it does not belong. The word tolerant means liberal broad-minded, willing to put up with beliefs opposed to one's convictions and the allowance of something not wholly approved. Tolerance, in one sense, implies the compromise of one's convictions and a yielding of ground upon important issues. Hence, over-tolerance in moral issues has made us soft, flabby, and devoid of conviction. We've become tolerant about divorce. We've become tolerant about the use of alcohol. We've become tolerant about delinquency. We've become tolerant about wickedness in high places. We've become tolerant about immorality. We've become tolerant about crime. And we've become tolerant about godlessness. In a book recently published on what prominent Americans believe, 60 out of 100 did not even mention God. And only 11 out of 100 mentioned Jesus. There was a manifest tolerance towards soft character and a broad-mindedness about morals characteristic of our day. We've been sacked of conviction, drained of our beliefs, and bereft of our faith. The sciences, however, are narrow-minded. There's no room for careless broad-mindedness in the laboratory. Water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit at sea level. It is never 100 degrees, nor 189 degrees, but always 212. Water freezes at 32 degrees. It is never 23 degrees or 31. Objects heavier than air always are attracted to the center of the earth. They always go down, never up. I know this is very narrow, but the law of gravity decrees it so, and science is very narrow. Mathematics is also very narrow-minded. The sum of two plus two is four, never three and a half. That seems very narrow, but arithmetic is not broad-minded. Geometry is also narrow-minded. It says that a straight line is the shortest distance between two points. That seems very dogmatic and narrow-minded, but geometry is intolerant. A compass is narrow-minded. It always points to the magnetic north. A compass is not very broad-minded. If it were, all the ships at sea and all the planes in the air would be in danger. If you should ask a man the direction to New York City and he said, oh, just take any road you wish, they all lead there, you would question either his sanity or his truthfulness. Somehow, we've gotten it into our minds that all roads lead to heaven. You hear people say, do your best, be honest, be sincere, and you'll make it to heaven all right. But Jesus Christ, who journeyed from heaven to earth and back to heaven again, and he knew the way better than any man that ever lived, said, enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. First, Jesus Christ was narrow about the way of salvation. He plainly pointed out that there are two roads in life. One is broad, lacking in faith, convictions, and morals. It is the easy, popular, careless way. 
It is the way of the crowd, the way of the majority, the way of the world. He said, many there be that go in thereat. But he pointed out that this road, easy though it be, popular though it be, heavily traveled though it is, leads to destruction. And in loving, compassionate intolerance, he says, enter ye in at the straight gate, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life. His was the intolerance of a pilot who maneuvers his plane through the storm, realizing that a single error, just one flash of broad-mindedness, might bring disaster to all those passengers on the plane. This past February, we were on a plane coming from Korea to Japan. It is about a five and a half hour flight. We ran through a rough snowstorm, and when we arrived over the airport in Tokyo, the ceiling and visibility were almost zero. The pilot had to make an instrument landing. I sat up in the cockpit with the pilot and watched him sweat it out as he was brought in by ground control approach. A man in the tower at the airport talked us in. I did not want these men to be broad-minded. I wanted them to be narrow-minded. I knew that our lives depended on it. Just so, when we come in for the landing in the great airport in heaven, I don't want any broad-mindedness. I want to come in on the beam, and even though I may be considered narrow here, I want to be sure of a safe landing there. Christ was so intolerant of man's lost estate that he left his lofty throne in the heavenlies, took on himself the form of man, suffered at the hands of evil men, and died on a cruel cross of shame to purchase our redemption. So serious was man's plight that he could not look upon it lightly. With the love that was his, he could not be broad-minded about a world held captive by its lust, its appetites, and its sins. Having paid such a fabulous price, he could not be tolerant about man's indifference toward him and the redemption he had wrought. He said, He that is for me is not against me, and he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, but he that believeth not upon the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth upon him. He spoke of two roads, two kingdoms, two masters, two rewards, and two eternities. And he said, Ye cannot serve God and man. We have the power to choose whom we will serve, but the alternative to choosing Christ brings certain destruction, said Jesus. The broad, wide, easy, popular way leads to death and destruction. Only the way of the cross leads home. The popular tolerant attitude toward the gospel of Christ is like a man going to watch the Cincinnati Reds and the Milwaukee Braves play a baseball game and rooting for both sides at the same time. These two clubs are in a torrid race in the National League. It would be impossible for a man who had no pledged loyalty to a particular team to really get in the game and enjoy it. Baseball fans are very intolerant in both Milwaukee, Brooklyn, and Cincinnati. If you would cheer for both sides in Cincinnati or Milwaukee, someone would yell, Hey, you, make up your mind. Who are you for? Christ said, You can't serve God and man. No man can serve two masters. He said, Make up your mind. Who are you for? One of the sins of this age is the sin of broad-mindedness. We need more people who will step out and say unashamedly, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We don't care how narrow it may seem. Secondly, Jesus was intolerant toward hypocrisy. He pronounced more woes on the Pharisee than any other sect because they were given to outward piety but inward sham. Woe unto you Pharisees and hypocrites, he said, for ye make clean the outside of the platter, but within you are full of extortion and excess. The church is a stage where all the performers are professors, but where too few of the professors are performers. A counterfeit Christian, single-handedly, can do more to retard the progress of the church than a dozen saints can do to forward it. That is why Jesus was so intolerant with sham. Dr. Harry Denham, Secretary of Evangelism of the Methodist Church, and I were talking about this very point this week at Lake Junaluska. Dr. Denham said, the greatest need in the church today is for church members to live what they profess. In Pilgrim's Progress, Formality and hypocrisy came tumbling over the wall into Christian's path. They were going for praise to Mount Zion and were searching for a shortcut. When they came to the hill difficulty, they shrunk back. The hill was steep and high, and there were two roads leading downward into an enticing valley. The name of the one was danger, and the name of the other was destruction. 
formality and hypocrisy, chose the easy roads which led them into impassable woods and swamps, and they were never heard of again. Sham's only reward, ladies and gentlemen, is everlasting destruction according to the Bible. It is the only sin which has no reward in this life. Robbers have their loot, murderers their revenge, drunkards their stimulation, but the hypocrite has nothing but the contempt of his neighbors and the judgment of God hereafter. That is why Jesus said, be not as the hypocrites. Thirdly, Jesus was intolerant towards selfishness. He said, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself. Self-centeredness is the basic cause of much of our distress in life. Hypochondria, a mental disorder which is accompanied by melancholy and depression, is often caused by self-pity and self-centeredness. Most of us suffer from spiritual nearsightedness. Our interests, our loves, and our energies are too often focused upon ourselves. Jesus was intolerant with selfishness. He underscored the fact that his disciples were to live outflowingly rather than selfishly. To the rich young ruler, he said, If thou wilt be perfect, go sell what thou hast, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. It wasn't the giving of his goods that Jesus demanded particularly, but his release from selfishness and its devastating effect on his personality and life and, of course, his future life. He was intolerant of selfishness when he said, For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. The life which Jesus urges us to lose is the selfishness that lives within us, the old nature of sin that is in conflict with God. Peter, James, and John left their nets, but Jesus did not object to nets as such. It was the selfish living which they symbolized that he wanted them to forsake. Matthew left the custom seat, a political job, to follow Christ. But Jesus did not object to a political career. It was the selfish quality of living in that day which it represented that he wanted Matthew to forsake. So in your life and in mine, self must be crucified in Christ enthroned. He was intolerant of any other way, for he knew that selfishness and the Spirit of God cannot exist together. Fourthly, Jesus was intolerant toward sin. He was tolerant toward the sinner, but intolerant toward the evil which enslaved him. To the adulteress, he said, neither do I condemn thee. Go thy way and sin no more. He forgave her because he loved her, but he condemned sin because he loathed it with a holy hatred. God has always been intolerant toward sin. His word says, wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes, cease to do evil. Awake to righteousness and sin not. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Christ was so intolerant toward sin that he died on the cross to free men from its power. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Sin lies at the root of most of society's difficulties today. Whatever separates man from God disunites man from man. The race problem that is burning in America today will never be completely solved until the question of sin has been settled. But the cross is God's answer to sin. To all who will receive the blessed news of salvation through Christ, it crosses out, cancels forever sin's power. Forest rangers know well the value of the burn back in fighting forest fires. To save an area from being burned, they simply burn away all of the trees and shrubs to a safe distance. And when the fire reaches that burned out spot, those standing there are safe from the flames. Fire is thus fought by fire. Calvary's cross was a colossal fighting of fire by fire. Christ, taking on himself all of our sins, allowed the fire of sin's judgment to fall upon him. The area around the cross has become a place of refuge for all who would escape the judgment of sin. Take your place with him at the cross today. Stand by the cross. Yield your life to him who redeemed you on the cross and the fire of sin's judgment can never touch you. God is intolerant towards sin, ladies and gentlemen. That intolerance sent his son to die for us. He has said that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. The clear implication is that those who refuse to believe in him shall be eternally lost. Come to Christ today while his spirit deals with your heart. At this moment, you can renounce your sins, receive Christ as Savior, be transformed, know that your past sins are forgiven, live a life with Christ here and now, and spend eternity with him. But in order to find him, you must come through the narrow gate of repentance and faith. Shall we pray? 
Our Father and our God, we pray in Christ's name that thy Holy Spirit will bring many through the narrow gates to the Savior today. For we ask it in his name. Amen.